The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Hello and good evening and welcome to Gen XYZ again and this is a program where we talk about contemporary issues or topics based on the youth. Now this week also we are going to talk about a very persistent issue right now and that's about the economic crisis not only affecting the youth but everyone here in Sri Lanka and the public is also little by little now facing the brunt as well because you see people in queues to get their gas cylinders or petrol and there's a scarcity of resources and a scarcity of foreign reserves as well and because of this the youth is also facing a, a little brunt with this situation and to talk on this topic we have two very special guests and that is Bodh Matra who is the economic research analyst at Econsult and also Shirani Lamperuma the chief editor of Biznomics magazine thank you nice to meet you both thank you. Shiran thanks nice for having us nice to meet us. you and thank you very much for taking the time to join with me on Gen XYZ this week and we're going to have a very elaborate conversation and talk about the current situation right now in Sri Lanka and how it's affecting the youth. Now to start off the discussion, there's a lot going on in Sri Lanka right now and it's becoming pretty vocal about it and people are talking about it but I feel that there's a lot of misinformation which is going up and down and even the people who know about the situation are becoming a little bit more technical in their explanation and people are having it a little bit difficult to understand exactly what's going on. So in simple terms, would you all be able to give a little explanation where Sri Lanka is right now? So, Shinali, to start off with, I think everyone is facing the economic crisis that we have right now and there's a consensus among everyone that the main issue is the lack of dollars and the lack of dollar inflows. So the technical term being we have a trade deficit or a current account deficit, but in layman's term we can say that it's a lack the revenue generated from our exports, both services and goods, does not meet the cons imported consumption of Sri Lanka. So basically we have less dollars coming in and more dollars going out. So this has been the case throughout the past four decades, but what's different from the past 10, uh, 15 years is that we've always had uh, enough debt financing to finance this uh, cash flow mismatch. So with that, now after COVID, when our taps, debt tap was closed, we face the current issue of not having enough dollars coming in to finance its cash flow mismatch. In that case, now we are seeing that we don't have enough money for fuel, not enough money for petrol, as in not enough money for gas, and even the most essential of items. And we've been slowly letting go of our reserves to purchase these items. And now people are feeling the burden of overconsumption of imports, whereas in the past years, we kind of could forget it because we had enough uh, debt financing so the government didn't really uh, let the people feel the pressure or the crisis that was already building up over the past four decades. I think Shiran, Shiran is there think, anything more that you would like to add? Um, I think both summed it up pretty well. I would just add to that the, the fact that I think people are uh, aware of this. It, I didn't, it doesn't give them any comfort but the fact is it is part of a global uh, crisis as well and we seem to be heading towards a global recession um, and uh, you know like the, the, the economy is, is never stable it goes in, in waves or what we call business cycles of, of uh, upticks in growth and then, and, and then recessions so currently um, we are sort of at the bottom of a business cycle and we've been on a downward trend the whole global economy is on a downward trend so for a country like Sri Lanka, which had pre-existing weaknesses, which both was talking about, like our trade deficit, um, the problem is a lot worse because we don't have 
you know, industrial capacity. We don't have much self-sufficiency um, in That's our right. food. Uh, we don't produce. We're heavily, heavily dependent on the service sector, on uh, tourism, for example. So, you know, we lose tourism for, for one or two years and, and suddenly we can't uh, stand on our own two feet. We can't afford fuel. Um, so, yeah, that, I think the, it's important to remember the global aspect, but also remember that the global aspect is only exacerbating our internal problems. That's right. Now, compar comparatively to the past 70 years, do you think Sri Lanka has been in a worse situation than this? Or do you think that this is the most severe economic crisis we are facing right now? I think that's a, a difficult question to answer simply because my personal view is that it's still too early to uh, see where things are going to go. Um, certainly in the 70s with like the OPEC um, oil crisis, things were really bad uh, and we mm -hmm. had a lot of the same issues and a lot of people make comparisons between the 1970s and now, uh, particularly with uh, the queues and the shortages and, and things like that. Uh, the global economy has changed a lot. Um, I wouldn't rule out the coming crisis globally to be worse in some ways than the 70s because um, you know we've seen massive spikes in, in the cost of like grain, essential foods, uh, dairy, in um, oil, energy. Um, and on top of that, we have a, a pandemic which is screwing up the uh, supply chains. So all of that is a pretty deadly cocktail, especially for a developing country like Sri Lanka that's um, not very big into production. Right. Now, just a small discussion that I would like to get your intakes on. What do you think of having an open economy or a mixed economy in your, in your terms? What do you think are the definitions and what do you think is suitable for Sri Lanka right now? considering the crisis we're in? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, personally, I feel like when, when you talk about open and closed economies, sometimes it's very much like a zero-sum game. I think no economy is totally open, no economy is totally closed. Even during uh, the so-called closed economy era uh, in Sri Lanka, you know, at that time, there was also a big uh, expansion in our diplomatic ties, right? So we were having diplomatic ties with Eastern Europe and Africa and China. Uh, we were expanding our trade with those countries, we were getting um, investments in heavy industry from the Soviet Union, from China. So, you know, it's, it's sometimes it, it gets a little bit ideological and a bit zero-sum talking about open and close. Um, so realistically, I would say, you know, a mixed economy is what seems to uh, work because naturally you can't be self-sufficient in everything, you can't have all the inputs that you need to uh, go for production, so you need to have some level of trade. Um, that said, I think the, the trend we're seeing now, and you know, oddly it was the United States of all countries under Trump that started it, is that we are probably going to see some shift towards um, a closed economy or, or more, uh, more self-reliance, more focus on the old ideas of import substitution. Um, and I wouldn't say that globalization will come to an end because of that, but certainly we'll see more, I think, regional engagements. So you see, you know, Russia sort of having its own sphere of influence and India and China and so there'll be multiple centers of gravity and countries like Sri Lanka will uh, certainly have to uh, I think close up to a certain extent and figure out what are the industries and what are the sectors that we can uh, promote to be self-sufficient in and also to, to export for. Both is there anything you would yeah. like to add I on think that? Adding on to that most people when we speak about the closed economy they think it's more like uh, it doesn't mean that just because it's closed doesn't mean that it's not a capitalistic society, right? Inside here, business, inside the country, will work in a competitive way. So it doesn't mean that there's a certain group of uh, people that benefit more. There will still be competition within the country for the industries because that's really important for those industries to grow. And the government of itself should make sure that that competition is there even though that there will be protective barriers from the outside, within the country, one person can't be protected over another person's uh, company. So those are some aspects that we have to look into, I think. Now, before the economic crisis, Sri Lanka underwent the COVID pandemic, not just Sri Lanka, worldwide. And what do you think that the COVID pandemic had to play in this economic crisis we are experiencing right now? Do you think that had to play a major role that we are in this situation right now? I think the, the, the pandemic, the COVID crisis certainly was uh, kind of like the spark that, that set things going. Um, of course, 
like I said earlier, the whole global economy was on a downward trend. Even even Sri Lanka had declining growth rates since about uh, 2012 or so. Um, there's been very little investment in, for example, manufacturing, production, in exports. Um, and we were heading towards a very service-dominated, financialized kind of uh, system. What, um, what COVID did, I feel, is it sort of um, exposed all of these weakness with a, you know, with a, a shock that basically stopped tourism. Uh, so we lose um, all of our foreign currency inflows from tourism. And uh, I think we've seen how painful that can be um, to have all our eggs in, in one basket. Um, in something like that um, so certainly uh, on top of that then you had the supply chain disruptions so again on the one on on the one hand like economists talk about um, you know being part of uh, global uh, global value chains but then you know the downside of it is when when there is a external shock like this there's no domestic value chain so then you're completely dependent on external inputs even even the garment sector a lot of the local production had um, trouble with um, the supply chain disruptions um, yeah I yeah. think both anything to add? I think the, with the COVID pandemic especially in the last year 2021 you could see how vulnerable Sri Lanka is when the price hikes happen globally. So even though within the local market there's a certain price level, when the price of fuel goes up, when the price of milk powder globally went up and the, uh, the freight rates went up after the supply chain disruption, it really impacted our inflation rate here. So the pass down inflation for a country which is not uh, really industrialized or developed to uh, a more where, like the Southeast Asian kind of countries is more higher like that's why we experience a higher rate of inflation before the rest of mm. Asia so like whereas in China where the inflation is dropping I think in January it dropped a few percentage uh, we have rising inflation yeah. So that is, that is quite common around more or less industrialized countries. I and, think. and China is continuing to ease their monetary policy, yeah. cutting the reserve ratio, you know, um, lending to the private sector, and yet their inflation is low. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's not even only the developing, even the US, since they're not really producing anything within the country anymore, they're also seeing the pass through effect of yeah. global price hike. All right. So, but I would say domestically and internationally, Sri Lanka was praised for how they handled this health crisis, and of our country has done a very well, a good job at it. And we've managed to sort out that issue. But do you think that it was at the cost of the sustainability of our economy? I guess that's if we think that our economy was sustainable to begin with before we, when we came into the pandemic, right? Like I was saying, we have been running a trade deficit, a current account deficit since the 19, since 1977. So since then, we have been in a deficit in the current account, which is our external account, as well as we have been accumulating so much debt over the past 10 years, which has now, as a result, we have like 6 billion uh, payments due every ne for the next four years. So we can't say that we, this was still the case before COVID. So we can't say that the way we handled COVID, maybe it kind of helped us actually to better face this. We mm. might have been in a worse off scenario if we didn't handle that whole health crisis. That's my opinion on that. Shinan, yeah, would you like I to agree with both on this? Yeah, I think I would uh, agree as well. Certainly some sacrifices um, on the economic side had to be made to control this pandemic, you know, with the lockdowns. I think every country um, went through that. Um, Sri Lanka, I think it was, it was you know, it was good that we managed to vaccinate our population uh, so quickly um, at the pace of some developing countries and sometimes even faster in certain develop, um, developed countries. So um, I think overall, again, it's um, sort of a, a difficult thing to do like a counterfactual and, and figure out what would have happened if we didn't do it, right? Uh, so suppose that we, we didn't lock down, suppose we didn't vaccinate and everyone got COVID and the, the health system was completely overloaded, right? So. That's a counterfactual that we have to think about. Uh, All right. Yeah. So before we continue our discussion, let's go into a short commercial break. We are discussing on the current situation of Sri Lanka and how it's affecting the youth. We'll be back soon. You're watching Gen XYZ.
welcome back to Gen XYZ and in the first segment we were talking about the current economic situation that Sri Lanka is in right now and in our second segment I would like to focus on how it's affecting the youth. Uh, Shiran and Bodha, uh, I would like to get your intake on now our generation, the younger generation is mostly interactive with the international arena. They're working freelancing and you know they have a lot of interaction and what advantages do you see in this that could help our uh, Sri Lankan economy? Well, I think firstly, to be, to be honest, there's going to be a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties, right? Um, but the flip side is, and strangely enough, this was a, uh, an entrepreneur who told me this uh, a few weeks ago, that um, at this point, at a low point of an economy, is when there are the most opportunities, the most chances to take risks because you can get in on something before you know the next wave of growth, the next upcycle. So I guess the uh, the young entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka will have to basically think very carefully about the future and examine the global trends. Uh, now is a really good time to you know uh, figure out what kind of economic activity is going to drive the next wave of growth, or figure out more importantly what kind of skills they need to be globally competitive, right? Um, so it's a very good time to, um, you know, to sort of batten down and get your priorities in order and really think about the future as hard as, as, hard as it is in the current situation. It's very important to do that because, you know, nothing is, nothing is forever. It's not going to stay at this trough forever. It's going to pick up at some point. And if you're a young person, you really need to think about how you're going to ride that wave. You know, what are the technologies that you should be familiar with? Uh, what are the skills you should have? Um, what are the businesses that maybe you'd want to uh, invest in or business models you'd want to invest in? So I would say those are the, the advantages and the opportunities within the current crisis. I think adding to that, our generation going through this whole crisis and with the rupee falling at a rate, I think it will be kind of embedded in us to value the fact of earning foreign revenue income Absolutely. because that is the only hedge that anyone can see because if you see all the tech companies who are doing uh, getting paid in dollars they peg their uh, all their salaries to the dollar whereas the rest of the country is just you know their salaries are going uh, on a real rate going down so i think it will be embedded within our generation going through this current crisis to uh, focus more on exporting their services as well as maybe producing goods yeah. that can be exported. Yeah. So you are definitely saying that this should be encouraged? Yes, I think so. Um, I think as both said, I think this crisis will probably instill uh, you know what, what some economists call export discipline <laughs> amongst the younger generations where you realize okay you know the crisis we're in is a dollar crisis so you know you need dollars to, to keep it going just not just for yourself and your business but for the country as a whole but definitely now comparatively with the previous generations there's just a niche market of us like uh, who are engaged with the international market and there are entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs out there who wants to showcase or start up their own businesses but right now they're afraid and they're afraid to take this huge risk because the country is also not in a good place right now so what advice can you give on that both if you can yeah i think shiran did kind of touch on this earlier as well in a time of crisis there are like so many problems out there to solve so entrepreneurs or new businesses basically start to solve some problem and if you look around i'm pretty sure all of us can see some problem and probably think of some solution to provide for the person having that problem. Maybe we will be having it as well, or maybe people around us, you know. So if you can like provide the people with a solution, then what is already there, currently looking at it, most of the solutions there might not be the best. So clearly I think our generation can think of some solutions and ways of solving the problems out there, even maybe with the fuel queues or the gas queues. Maybe you can do home delivery of gas, gas. Like if you go to Litro and say, I want to supply this gas and you have an online site or something where you people place the order. So the queue is no, no more. There are like examples. I'm pretty sure people probably have thought of it, but thinking of this crisis pushed back into not starting a business. Maybe there is on one hand the whole idea of how am I going to finance it? Yeah. But if you could find a way 
I think definitely there's opportunity to ma- become a, a business man or entrepreneur. Yeah, definitely. And one problem, I, a major problem right now is finding the finances to do what you really want to do. And because the inflation rates are going up like every day. And um, Shiran, what can you say about that, about the inflation rates? Is it something that people or the youngsters out there need to be concerned about? Do you think that we will be able to come into a stabilized rate in the future, in the near future? In the near future, I'm not sure. I mean, the, with the uh, current policies in place to uh, you know, float the currency, I'm not sure at what point the devaluation of the currency will stop because uh, I think that devaluation is also going to drive inflation. Uh, that's why I think both and I both emphasize that, you know, if there are young entrepreneurs out there who can bring in dollars, it would be better for them and for the country as well. Um, the inflation is uh, certainly going to be um, a problem for, you know, young people, especially if you don't have a large amount of savings, what little you have is going to be uh, eaten up. But uh, I think that's like all the more reason that uh, instead of just sitting on your savings, you should try to figure out to do something about it, to, you know, put it into the economy and start a small business or, um, you know, some uh, invest in something for the future, yeah. In terms of business, where would you say right now is the best place to invest, in your personal opinion? Hmm. Okay. Both, I'll leave that to you. I think, I think the best thing that right now you can invest is maybe in some tech related skills in yourself Mm. because uh, going back to even like freelancers if you have a skill and which sometimes now can be uh, like found for free of charge like there's Google uh, and LinkedIn they provide these education programs which are free and these are recognized by some of the companies that hire people here itself. And even if you want to freelance, there are so many opportunities. So basically, if you can invest in developing a skill that uh, someone else would need, I think that's the best investment right that you can make right now. Yeah. All right, I think sure. uh, a skill like coding, for example, you know, so for, for people who don't do it, it sounds really intimidating. I mean, I, I don't code myself and it sounds really intimidating, but from what I understand now, um, you know, all the learning materials are freely available. And in the future, I think no matter, um, no matter what sector you're in, you don't have to be in IT, it would still be extremely beneficial to know how to code. Um, you know, you, you could be uh, in, in econ or, or an engineer or in finance or in media. It's just uh, kind of a universal skill as we head towards a more like technologically intensive economy. That is definitely some interesting advice and I think that's going to be very useful for our viewers out there to invest on enhancing your skills yes. right now because there's nothing else you can do right now. And another thing I would like to ask you all is what do you think the private or the public firms can do in order to develop or contribute in gaining back normalcy in the economic situation we are facing? What can they do? So there's a, a, a range of things that we can do. Something uh, that I think both, both and I have discussed a lot is about um, this price management uh, and the, the risk of prices fluctuating. Um, I think the both the private sector and definitely the public sector they don't do a very good uh, job in this. So if I give you a small example of uh, fuel, right? So when we got independence, we had um, strategic reserve capacity for fuel that could last, um, I think, more than a year or so, uh, or or even a couple of years. Um, Right now, we haven't built that capacity. So as our population has increased and our economy has grown, now our strategic reserve capacity is maybe a couple of months, right? So basically what that means is when prices go down, you don't have the capacity to store up and save for the future. So you're constantly exposed to fluctuating prices. Um, And on top of that, you also have the, uh, you know, there are other methods also to to manage price, right? So you can hedge, you can go into forward contracts. And you see a lot of SOEs in other countries, they do that, right? Um, I think both, you did a study on Singapore Airlines, right? How they do it? Singapore Airlines, actually, Ryanair was the one. So Ryanair has hedged their oil at $60 a barrel, and now it's at 120 dollars a barrel so throughout the ne- till, till the next summer the price is hedged at that so the tickets they can really keep the tickets at the same price whereas it works in both ways it, it's a good profit gain for them because they win market share 
because if a com airline didn't hedge, obviously their prices would hike, whereas Ryanair can now capture that market as well. So it's a win-win, both for the consumer as well as for the company itself. Even uh, looking back, uh, the Indian Oil Corporation, they also hedged uh, their oil. So uh, it was pretty simple for the Sri Lankan uh, energy companies to also hedge their costs when it fell. Because it, is, it was kind of a no-brainer when oil dropped below 40, because oil can't sus the oil companies, the producers, can't sustain uh, at oil below 40, so it was bound to come up. Right. Yeah, I think that's certainly one of the ways that, uh, you know, we've talked about inflation before. Uh, so, you know, there are ways to control inflation. Usually, we, uh, you know, sometimes we look at the, the, the spot market price of a good and we panic. Uh, because in Sri Lanka, the, the spot market prices, you know, that's what we we'll constantly have to deal with. But if you have mechanisms to uh, manage price, to go into long-term contracts, to have reserves, that's not an issue. I mean, we just talked about energy, right, which is like an upstream input. You can also do that for uh, grain. And that's something that, you know, ancient Chinese dynasties were also doing, right? So when there's a big harvest, you, the state buys some of the grain and puts it in storage. When there's a small harvest, they release that grain. So the price is stabilized, everyone has food to eat. That's kind of the bare minimum thing, which I think certainly the, the SOEs and the public sector can do and to, to an extent I think the private sector should also be thinking of doing this instead of always passing the cost on to the consumer. Something both you mentioned was that freelancers are emerging and that's becoming a very current trend right now and uh, I would say that do you think that the current policies which are implemented here, economic policies which are uh, implemented, do you think the freelancers were affected in a way because of this? I think the current policies globally which have affected Sri Lanka especially once again with the depreciation would only encourage you to freelance for foreign uh, projects and as well I think the freelance community was quite under the radar and policies were not really focused on them mm -hmm. so right now with mo them emerging out I think now only we'll actually get to see what policies uh, will be put uh, to their regards. Alright, to continue this discussion, we'll go into a short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ, we'll be back soon. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we have come to our last segment and we are in discussion with both and Shiran and the first two segments we spoke about how the economic crisis is affecting the youth as well. Now I would say a large amount of the youngsters out there are migrating abroad because they feel that they can add value to themselves with their higher studies or probably doing a job into their lives by moving abroad. Do you think that this is affecting the current economic crisis here in Sri Lanka? Um, both if you... Yeah, both. I think uh, we have to see, look at why they are actually migrating abroad. Maybe it's because there is, they don't see an opportunity here. Exactly. Yeah, maybe there is no job opportunity to the scale that they want to or to the growth path that they wish to have. So even education-wise, maybe they want to have a skill which is more of a higher value than what is offered in this current syllabus of Sri Lanka. Mm. So you can't really blame them for looking elsewhere, mm -hmm. as well as there might be another group of people who are thinking of migrating, not for that same objective reason, but more as a trend, you know, they feel like, okay, they'll get a better deal if they go abroad. but. It might not always be the case, whereas in Sri Lanka they might not want to compromise, whereas when they go abroad they will be forced to compromise. Because when you go out there abroad, you're dealing with a, a bigger, uh, bigger, what do you call a bigger competition from, mm -hmm. uh, like there's more competition for the same job you're applying to and they might be of a higher uh, 
education background, more experience than you. Whereas here, you might have a higher advantage, whereas abroad, you might lose that advantage you have here. So you have to think of like the opportunity that is available and objectively think, is it better? Like, can I become a better person, a better skilled employee or have a better business here or have a better business out there? So you have to think of it objectively and you shouldn't discourage people from going but you should discourage them if they're just following a trend and going abroad, I think. Yeah. Shinan, would you like to agree with both on this as well? True, yeah, I, I, I would agree as well. I mean, uh, I was actually thinking I would love to give the, uh, the patriotic answer and say no, stay in Sri Lanka and make it uh, work. And it would be great, obviously, if there are dedicated young people uh, to do that. Like, I've been abroad uh, myself, but, you know, um, I'm here now trying to, you know, uh, contribute in some way. Uh, that said, you know, if you if you can get a good opportunity abroad, if you can get uh, a decent salary where you can maybe send some money back to the country to support your family, or you can uh, save some money, get some good skills, some exposure, come back and uh, start a business, something like that. I mean, I think that would also be uh, extremely helpful for the country. I think it should even be in encouraged to a certain extent. But right now, considering the current situation, people are scared and that's why yes. they just want to migrate. And I believe that the current generation right now has more facilities than the previous generations to migrate abroad. They have the finances, they have the opportunities, they have the skill as well. Mm -hmm. But considering the situation here in Sri Lanka, they feel insecure. Mm -hmm. What advice can you give or do you think that this should be encouraged even further? Um, I think, uh, so if you're talking about encouragement on the policy level, I think the, the government will have to be very careful about how they do it, right? So um, the, our, our whole education structure and uh, vocational and technical training will have to be designed in such a way that actually meets the um, demand for skills in different countries. And then also designed in such a way that you hope that these people come back and are able to contribute in some sort of progressive way for the country rather than you know just giving people um, a pathway to to uh, migrate and leave the country permanently right so there should be some sort of incentives for them to um, you know to to come back here to to um, save their money here to invest in businesses here um, what kind of hope do you think that they have right now here in sri lanka what can they look forward to you mean for, for youth who uh, choose to stay in, in yes. Sri Lanka? Yes. Well, I mean, this might not be the most comforting thing to say, but you're kind of witnessing history right now. Um, you know, to, to to live through a time like this and see these, uh, you know, tectonic shifts in, in geopolitics, in, in global capitalism. Um, you know, you're witnessing the, the rise and fall of firms, of nations. Um, and of course, it's you know there's a crisis in between it. Uh, there's challenges, but as as we've tried to emphasize, there are also opportunities uh, during this time. Right, uh, this is a time of immense change, immense upheaval. Um, so there are opportunities if you can if you know how to look for it. What do you think that the youth should look out for right now? Finding a temporary solution or a short-term solution, or thinking ahead in the future, a long-term fix. Or what do you think the country should be doing right now? Should they be considering just short-term fixes or they should be considering the future aspect as well? Right now, where are we? Um, so, p personally, I, I think for, from a, a government perspective, it's, it's not good to draw um, a line between short, medium and long-term because these things flow into one another. And sometimes, it's, sometimes you can go for a short-term quick fix but that doesn't fix uh, the long-term uh, yes. structural issue, right? So, um, I mean, we, in, the, in the previous segments, we talked about some of the structural issues, uh, you know, the, the trade deficit, the, la the lack of manufacturing in this country, the lack of uh, production, um, uh, the lack of uh, price management, uh, our exposure to uh, external markets. So those things, you know, there are short-term and long-term ways to deal with it. The government has to look at both in like a holistic way. Um, for youth specifically, how they should uh, deal with it. I think that that very much uh, depends on your uh, you know what they call risk appetite or also your capability to absorb some of these shocks right so you know let, let's be real if you're someone of a of a low income and you just can't you don't have the savings to absorb the shock 
it might be better for you to you know consider migrating at least for a short period of time you know save some money until things settle down and then you know bring your savings uh, back home to your family to uh, to start something but what are your thoughts on this i think on a policy point of view it's important that we address the current uh, shortages and fuel cuts because even for the long term it's not uh, beneficial for the businesses to go through this power cuts because since we have a path that is set where we want to go towards a production economy it's important that we don't give up on that in the short term and like allow for these power cuts to disrupt that production because we have that goal and if by now we are like not allowing like not facilitating the energy energy uh, demand that is needed so in the long run like we won't even be getting more investors coming in and setting up businesses because they see this and they think okay if this country goes for another shock this is what's going to happen so in the next 10 years why would i make an investment for 10 years here because if they go for another shock the government is just going to like push it all out on the people and let it just go be passed down the whole cost so i think they must look at that and uh, address this current issue and off but not uh, sway themselves away from that path to production and manufacturing which will allow us to come out of that chronic uh, case of our trade deficit and current account deficit which is the cause for this crisis in the first place and another problem we are facing now is we need to focus on our exports and you can correct me if i'm wrong but uh, i feel that sri lanka is not having a problem with the capacity of exports it's just the value of it and uh, the government also has been emphasizing on increasing the value of production so what do you think companies or the country can do per se to increase this value um i think the 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 government just needs to look less at economic theory and more at of economic history of how you know other countries in the region did this so we don't have to reinvent the wheel right other countries have gone from underdeveloped low income agricultural to you know high income you know high tech manufacturing you know korea has done this china has done this japan has done this singapore so i think you know the government can just look objectively into the policies that these countries have taken and how they got to where they are um so you don't need to follow the textbook theory you just need to see what works uh in terms of increasing um the the domestic value i think the the private and public sector need to find ways to build uh, synergies between different uh, economic sectors so you know for example we have we have the apparel sector which um which has some comparative advantages but you know overall if you if you look at its dependency on you know its uh, imported uh, dyes imported uh, textiles and fabrics imported um accessories so there's no dynamism or, or synergy because these things aren't made locally and when they're not made locally there's no sort of local value addition that you talked about and also sri lanka as a country can't you know go to a global buy and say like look we have the entire solution for you like from you know from from thread to the finished product we can make everything and and, and give it to you uh and you know there's the design aspect as well So those synergies I think are very important when you when you go for industrialization. I just use the garment industry as an example but you know it it applies for say automobiles you know if you you can you can do assembly but you should also be making a few of the parts. It goes for electronics as well you can you know assemble laptops but you should also be looking at making you know some of the some of the chips and things like that. As you said uh, Shiran the other countries international countries also have been facing an economic crisis and they have been handling a same situation as well how do you think sri lanka is faring comparatively to the international countries um pod do you want to take that question yeah i think comparatively we have to see the sri lanka has a, a scenario where most of the other countries don't have which is our debt repayment burden uh, so if we compare most of the asian countries they also do have current account deficits but our outflows or like our dollar repayment demands are higher we have the current account deficit on the one hand and we have a 6 billion annual debt repayment so there's more stress uh, on our demand for dollar dollars within the country so i 
looking at in that way, that seemed to me, if, for me to be the only difference. Where that's why we see that we are in a bigger crisis when we compare ourselves to the rest of Asia. So, I think the only shift away from it is an expo export uh, led, production led growth path rather than uh, the same import dependent trader economy or like a being a trader country growth path because we have been doing that for the last years and it kind of has not worked out as we can see now. Yeah. Okay, now as we discussed earlier, the youth out there, there are so many young entrepreneurs, so many skilled people out there, but they just don't have the platform to showcase their ideas or their business ideas or what uh, whatnot. But what do you think as a country or even private firms or public firms can do to capitalize this resource that we have without you know encouraging them to migrate because i feel that sri lanka needs them right now especially the younger generation we need young mindsets we need young skill what can we do as a nation to capitalize on this resource we have i think the resource that we have uh, right now we have to see if uh, the companies, the private sector, offers them the jobs that they are looking for, or if they, on the other hand, also if they have been, they have got the education that the private sector is looking for. Yes. So if, if there's a skill mismatch yeah, there. So if our tech industry is looking at adding thousand, uh, uh, adding a new thousand employees every year, do we produce thousand uh, graduates in that skill, or do we produce a thousand graduates who are skilled at arts, like? So there's a mismatch. Mm. So there are industries that are uh, growing and that need that talent, high high skill talent as well, with a uh, high payout as well. Like so, it's like a win-win. So, uh, but our education system might not be putting out that talent or even giving the kids or like the youth the opportunity to learn that talent because those aren't offered really yeah. in the country. I think it would also be useful to. Uh provide more alternative means of uh, education rather than the very uh, you know conventional uh, uh, schooling path you see a lot of uh, industrialized or developed nations they have uh, sort of a dual system like if you take germany for example where you know you don't you don't have to go into academia and 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 go into uh, university and and all of that and and spend years doing that if that's not your interest right um, there's no you know there's no pressure that oh you have to get a university degree because let's be real that's not for for everyone right so I think we could use more um, say technical and vocational training uh, for for people who want a different you know pathway who maybe um, you know who are people who are interested in making things um, or you know which is useful for a manufacturing economy as well to have that kind of technical education so that even if you have a skills mismatch which both just mentioned you could always reskill yourself you could you know join a technical training institute hopefully the government can provide it at a at a very cheap rate or at a at a cheap loan and you could reskill yourself with something that you might be more interested in and the job market might be more interested in all right shiran and both i think we are moving to the end of our last segment also as my final question is there any words of encouragement that you can give to the viewers who are watching this and the youth out there uh, in order to, you know, a message of hope where they, they, they can think like, okay, my skill is valued here in Sri Lanka and I can look forward for something in contributing to my country. I think if I'd go first, like I mentioned before, it's important to see that there are these problems, but you can also come up with some solutions for these problems, as well as uh, looking at what are the skills that the job market is looking out there for Sri Lanka and which jobs will have a higher growth path which will be the new wave of growth and trying to upskill yourself or get get the skill needed to align with that growth path so I think that's what I would tell you yeah. to see first where the growth is headed and uh, align with that Shiran is there anything I think uh, I'd also add that you know it's like it's never too late to to pick up a new skill right so if we're, we're addressing youth you know even if you finished high school even if you finished 
university there's a lot of time for you to pick up new skills and and the trend is i think globally that a lot of young people they switch from industry to industry it's rare nowadays for someone to stay in the same sector or the same job um, forever so you know make use of the of the current uh, crisis and uh, you know figure out how to ride the next wave up and thank you very much i'm we come to the end of our program as well thank you for taking the time to share your experience and your insights on the current situation of the economic crisis and i feel that the youth will be able to take something out of this program and thank you very much and thank that you. was our program on gen xyz this week and we will be back again next week with another pertaining issue that affecting the youth just in case you couldn't watch us on air you can always rewatch by catching us on our youtube page youtube.com/abdurrahman english i'm suzanne shinali stay safe and have a good night